We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has Chad, thanks for being on again. Yeah. Um, it's always good to talk to you and uh, appreciate your expertise and, and and your service under the Trump administration, Department of Homeland Security Secretary. So um, obviously you're a multi-time guest here. So we, uh, we're, yeah, we, we're, we we just finished our, you were actually our first guest for our cartel task force meeting. Uh, we had some members in here uh, grilling you with, with, with yeah. questions. Yeah. Good questions though. I thought, thought, thought there were good questions and, and, and your answers were great. It was, it was, it was a great first meeting, yeah. helpful to just, lay out the problem give us some history to it also i mean you told me some things i didn't know my first question to you was is anyone in charge of this right like you know strategically speaking because you you do have to combine a a lot of different uh, nodes i guess um lines of effort let's say to to solving this problem there's again there's like the local dealer problem and the problem being of course Cartels and, and specifically the fentanyl dealing from the yeah. cartels that's actually killing people on a daily basis. You got your local gangs, you've got your corrupt politicians in Mexico, um, you, you've got your, your very complex supply chains, you've got the precursors from China, um, and there's, there's a few more to that. You've got your financing, uh, and then you've got your actual operations, your, your network targeting operations in the cartels. And so, you know, one of the goals I have is to figure out. And you've got your diplomacy, right? How do you deal with, with Mexican culture and Mexican politics? That's a really difficult one. And then who was really thinking about this at a very high level? Who, who, was, the, who was somebody with some authority who was only thinking about how to combine all that? And well, you gave an interesting answer. There was something like that at the State Department for a while. Right. So I don't, I don't think it's occurring at the highest levels. Yeah. Um, during the Trump administration, it was the Transnational Criminal Task Force or some variation of that name. Yeah. Um, very sort of mid-level folks, you know, participating from State Department, DHS, Department of Justice, and a few other um, agencies. Um, but no decision-making authority, no ability to divert resources. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it ever really rose to the appropriate level. You know, maybe it stayed at a what we call a PCC, which is a policy coordinating committee mm-hmm. inside the NSC, which is low-level right. uh, stuff, and didn't really make it to the higher levels. A lot of yeah. PowerPoints. A lot of reports, yeah, and a lot of recommendations, but no follow through. And yeah. so I think uh, we were in a very different position in 2018 than what you see today, right? Yeah. We don't have that this humanitarian crisis. We don't. We didn't have the fentanyl crisis like we do today. Mm-hmm. So things have changed, That's and true. I think it, re- it 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 begs the question of this needs to be elevated um, inside, whether it's inside the NSC. Now again, during the Trump administration, if you if something big enough, the vice president was in charge of it. Yeah. You know, we saw that with the COVID task force. We saw that with a variety of other things that he did. Um, You put someone in charge who can make some hard decisions. When DOJ says, no, you know, I really don't want to involve those investigations. Mm -hmm. Well, you need to. Yeah. You know, or DHS, I need HSI investigators to be pulled off of a couple other things and dedicated to these types of investigations, whether it's cash or drugs or money or or, or, uh, whatever arms whatever it might be, um, without that, without that senior level leadership, right. it's, it's just going to be inside task force and in reports and meetings without any of that. So, I mean, it, is, it has to reside you know, in the Eisenhower building, at least at the NSC or the vice president's office and, you know, the vice president's Kamala Harris. So I'm reluctant to say that it should, it should reside. I, I think you've got problems depending on who you pick inside that building, but <laughs> I mean, the National Security Advisor needs to be involved in this. Yeah. Like, this is a matter of national security. It's not just a law enforcement issue along the border killing 100,000 Americans a year. And so we got to get serious about this. And so you need, whether it's the Vice President or the National Security Advisor, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, they they all have assets. They all have authorities to bring to bear on this issue. Right. Uh, But you've got to get them moving and you got to hold them accountable. It's not enough to have meetings. Yeah. You've got to hold them accountable. I feel like the, kind of one of the points of this task force is to actually be that entity yeah. that's looking at it holistically because there's, again, I can list a lot of different nodes and, and you've got also, somebody has to be saying, okay, this, the supply chain issue is just too hard. Um, 
And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it is just too hard. Uh, so let's move on to the next node. Like what's, what's the low hanging fruit that we can hit right now? And nobody's really strategically answering that question. And there's the really difficult question. You brought it up a lot. What's the carrot and stick approach, which is an extremely delicate dance that, that to, to deal with the, the Mexican government, especially a guy like AMLO. Yeah. These are really hard questions to answer. Super hard. <laughs> really, so, really, really difficult. Look, I think an example, if I go back to, again to the Trump administration, what Congress did, uh, particularly as it relates to cybersecurity, they had something called the Cybersecurity Solarium, I believe. But mm -hmm. it, was, it was a joint effort between uh, the executive branch and Congress. And they would meet collectively and really go through a productive agenda. So I, I would point to that. I should have mentioned that during task yeah. force. That may be a, not a model, but maybe um, it may help you kind of understand how do you work with the executive branch, right? I served there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you hold Congress at arm's length. You're like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That we get that impression. So, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that that model actually worked. Oh, well, so what's the model exactly? It, like, well, it was called the Cybersecurity Solarium, and it was in the CISA, I think, originating okay. uh, legislature, or perhaps an appropriations bill. They organized it in a way where there was buy-in from all sides, hmm. um, and there was good feedback, and there was recommendations, and people acted on the recommendations. Mm -hmm. So we, I think it's I think it's really good. On your AMLO question, though, it's it's tough. He's a compromised partner in all of this, if he's a partner at all. It's, it's confusing, yeah. right? Like, so, you know, and that the, there's a lot, there's a lot that the government of Mexico is doing, um, but mostly from the military, oh, entirely from the military side. Um, and you know, he, in theory approves that, um, it's confusing. Mean, that's all I can say. It's confusing without getting into like some serious details on, on what's going on. Um, well, well, it, it's, it's confusing. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not least. Um, whether it was the previous or, or even AMLO, we would meet with them and sit, they, would, they would say exactly that. We're doing all these different things um, and we're making inroads. And the more we dug, well, what are your metrics for success? Yeah. How much are you actually interdicting? How much are you... And it became a little less clear, more fuzzy over time. Well, they, they, and they'll still say openly, we don't have fentanyl in Mexico. And you're like, oh, come on. Now, quietly behind closed doors, they absolutely say they have fentanyl problem in Mexico. Um, I would say what they are doing, what we do have metrics from is like the actual targeting of individuals, you know, those that from mid-level to higher yep. level cartel members, what they, what they're lacking in, and this is something we didn't even get to in the meeting, um, is, is the corruption issue. And, I, you know, I, I brought this up where I was like, I, 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 I noticed in my trip to Mexico that, um, you know, I look at the lives of these drug kingpins and their lives suck. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want that life. <laughs> seems, seems cool for a week. And then, but you know, they're moving every night. They're not, they're not exactly living the, uh, a great life. Sure. They got a lot of money and they, I'm sure they're moving to nice apartments and nice houses every time, but it, other lives suck. And so, you know, it begs the question, then why do this? And it's because they're just, they're just figureheads. They're mm -hmm. middlemen in the end. They're not really in charge. There's corrupt politicians and judges and attorneys and prosecutors who are in charge. And look, sometimes that that's because of malevolence and sometimes that's out of fear. Uh, whatever the case, I mean, there's entire towns, states that are just run by the cartels or, you know, and, 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 and even in, in an informal manner. Um, and it, what, what we've seen is I'm always willing to take on. He, he, I mean, one of his big talking points is like taking on corruption. Well, corruption against the other party. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, ha happy to see that. Um, but then they get really pissed off. What was his slogan? Cubs, not guns. Yeah, yeah, it's um, uh, abrazos, no balazos, yeah. you know? And so, well, there's that aspect of it, like this sort of like piece is very, very similar to the new president of Colombia, which is frustrating too. That's a whole other subject. Um, but but, it, but he's, I don't know if what his, what his corruption slogan is, yeah. but it's pretty obvious that it's it's still politically motivated, right? It better not be his party. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, how we, how we overcome that is, I, I, I agree with you, it's, it's transactional, right? It's, it's a carrot stick approach. Yeah. They want to see something for them. You do have to threaten them a little bit. Uh, this administ the Biden administration has taken a carrot approach, yeah. a carrot only approach, carrot right? Only, right? And I guess it's better than nothing. Um, but, you know, well, actually, we speak to that. You spoke to that a little bit. And so the recent deal on, on, on the borders is, you know, this is related to cartels, but it's, it's mostly on the immigration yeah. side. Um, talk to us about how effective you really think that that new deal is where it's, you know, basically we, we parole 30,000 people a month, but they take back 30,000 people a month. Um, the, the numbers, we, we see illegal crossing numbers go down quite a bit, but to your point, 
you, you we see a massive increase in point of entry numbers because it's an easy process. So I think that I think that the demand has not diminished in it. I don't yeah. think anything from this administration, as far as a s strategic, has incre has decreased demand. It's the flows are just moving in different areas, mm -hmm. right? And so they their idea is so let's move them out of the desert into a port of entry. Um, let's not try to deter the illegal behavior. So whether you arrive in the middle of the desert or at a port of entry, you are still uh, not legally allowed into the United States. You can't just show up and be like, hey, I want to come in. But that's what's occurring at a port of entry. Yeah. yeah. It's you come to a port of entry, you download the CBP one app and you say, hey, I want in. Yeah. I get paroled in. Right. Um, or you get, you get released under their asylum. You know what I was told when I was in, in Mexico was, uh, the primary users, users of the CBP app are often Russians. There's, there's a mass increase in Russian because they're just better at figuring it out. <laughs> like I, mean, for Noah, that was, yeah. that was the reasoning. It was like, they're just better at kind of figuring out how to use the technology. <laughs> well, I think what it tells you is, you know, before, um, really going up to 2019, 2020, the vast majority of folks are Central Americans and South Americans. Yeah. It was a hemisphere issue. What you see today is vastly different. Oh, it's, it's all and over the place. It's all over the place. But you have 10,000 Chinese nationals. Seems odd. Why they want right. to come to Tijuana yeah. and then cross the border, right? There, there's a reason that all of this is occurring. Mm -hmm. And if you were to listen to this administration, it's because everyone wants a better life. Yeah. And that's just, that's not the reality. If you talk to law enforcement officers along that border, that's not the reality. They are having, there's more, it used to be going back a couple of years and you still have a little bit of this. People yep. would come across the border and they would sit down and they would wait for border patrol mm -hmm. and they would be upset when border patrol would take an hour to get to them. Yeah. Right. They'd be upset, but you're seeing more and more absconding today. That's yeah. That's uh, concerning. The, pe that's, the people trying to get away are concerning. Yeah. I mean, I would say that's the only benefit and I'm trying to give like a benefit where benefit is due, but the one benefit to pushing everything through a point of entry is that border patrol can start to do their actual job, which is trying to catch those people absconding. I mean, one of the things I didn't you know we noticed time and time again with the cartels do is in order to get those people who they who they don't want caught, they tie up border patrol resources with a hundred migrants at a time who will just sit there, right? Yeah, they're just economic migrants for the yeah. most part. But um, you still see the number of gotaways, you know, sixty thousand last month. So you still see these numbers really really high yeah, that's drastic um and it's high for a number of reasons right it's the fentanyl i mean this idea that only fentanyl is coming through ports of entry is crazy yeah. when you see these pictures of people in camo and have backpacks what do you, what do you think yeah. they have yeah what like, do you think they're doing yeah they're just they're just, just they're not out for a walk yeah no, they're going to work for their construction job yeah <laughs> they're, they're smuggling they're, illegal narcotics it's almost right fentanyl we got into this argument we did a, a not with the energy and commerce committee actually we went to the border and we just like, this big fight and i'm like I, I could not understand why my Democrat colleagues just wouldn't accept that what our what our Border Patrol witnesses were yeah. telling yeah. us. It's like, yes, we catch most of it there, but we're we're catching most of it there because that's where we have the systems in right. place to actually catch it. You know, and the reason they've moved to fentanyl is because it's so much easier to smuggle. I mean, yeah. it's like one one kilo is some absurd number of pills you can make from one kilo. I think it's like three hundred fifty thousand, or uh, it's an absurd number. Um, highly profitable for them, even if they kill a bunch of their customers. So it's it's an overall disaster. W one question I had actually for you, one last one was, because um, it was brought up that there's frustration in Central American countries that they just don't get attention from us, especially their State Department. Yeah. Um, what uh, Which countries would you recommend, you know, if, if we were to, because one thing these countries like is that when congressional delegations actually come down and it shows that we care, that, we, yeah. that we're paying attention, which ones would you choose that we should pay attention to the most. Um, I'd be obviously Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Uh, putting Guatemala, Mexico aside. Yeah, El Salvador, uh, Honduras is a little. Uh, it's what? Uh, yeah, but they've all some things going on. Yeah, <laughs> they've all changed the different political leadership since the Trump administration. But I still think Guatemalans were always reasonable. Yeah, um, Hondurans, you know, it was a different animal. Um, El Salvador, yeah, again reasonable. Uh, Panama, reasonable. Yeah, yeah but uh, Panama. So I, I think they all want to be partners. They all have their different challenges. Um, but, you, you know, for President Trump, it was his number one issue in dealing with most of these countries, not all, but most. Yeah. Um, and they knew that. And so yeah. when I would go down there or when the Secretary of State would go down there, it, it wasn't that we had to bring up the issue. Mm -hmm. It was what they were ready to talk about. Yeah. You know, like they had a plan. Here's what we're doing. And it, it was it was issue number one. And I'd. 
paying cool. attention just goes so much further than people realize. Was that paying just paying oh, attention? Just, yeah, you know, just a phone call. Having, you know, for us, it was having President Trump make statements and speeches or tweets or whatever it might be. Yeah, it that matters to them. get noticed, yeah. and they're like, "Whoa!" You know, President of the United States is actually talking about things that are occurring here in El Salvador, right? right. And I'm going to take notice of that, and we're we're going to find some solutions here. Yeah. So I often talk about leadership, priority setting. It's such a big part of what the executive branch can do. They've got a lot of resources and a lot of authorities. Not the most of it doesn't ever get used. Yeah. Actually, prioritize it. And one of the things that came up in this meeting was there's, there's a lot of law enforcement activity um, from Homeland, from HSI, from DEA, from DOJ um, directed at this problem. Uh, yesterday I visited uh, DEA, uh, Special Operations Division. I, I would I would sort of describe it as like the NCTC of the the counter narcotics world. Um, it's a good place, a lot of a lot of capability there, uh, a lot of like a great um, uh, great kind of analytical hub yeah. or that that supports forward forward looking units. Um, but it's all law enforcement. And, you know, we had the discussion of the terrorist designation too, and, and they had some interesting feedback, um, which was which was that it, the more you push it into a terrorist domain, the more you're using classified capabilities to go after them. Now that's effective in, in many ways, but it also screws up their casework. And so that was, that was some interesting feedback too. And I, I think it's why a lot of us have said, okay, what's the middle ground there? Like what can we designate them as yeah. um, to get all the benefits of that terrorist designation without all of the- So they're designated today as TCOs. Yeah. Um, and so the question maybe is, how do you just beef up that designation? Just beef it up. Give yeah. it more teeth. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day. Look, I, and we talked about this. Um, I, I think we should continue the law enforcement mission that we have, right? Yeah. EA, ATF. HSI, all the different agencies. Because yeah. these high profile prosecutions and extraditions, yeah. they, they work. They send a message. Yeah, they, they work. I just don't think it's enough. No, it's not enough. It's, and so we've got to think outside the box here a little right. bit if we want to really attack this problem. Here's one thing I noticed. Um, I, I watched how the Mexican army uh, took out the, one of the chapitos, El, El Raton, the, the, his, his name's Ovidio. This is the raid back in early, earlier this year. Mm -hmm. It meant a lot of headlines because I think they lost 14 guys doing that. It was a uh, pretty complex operation into rural Mexico to go get okay. these guys. Big firefight, um, big QRF mission to yep. try and rescue the guys who were on target with, with Ovidio's family. Um, just a very dramatic uh, operation all in all. And one thing I noticed was these guys have no close air support. There's no close air support. So they're surrounded by cartel members with, with armored vehicles, 50 cals, uh, 50 cal machine guns mounted to those things. They're taking extremely effective fire into this compound. It's amazing. They, they survived it all. Um, and they have no close air support. See, if I was in that situation, we'd just call on our AC-130 yeah. gunship and boom, boom, boom. You got yeah. 30 mic mic rounds just nailing all of these guys and they're dead. And then you walk out. They have none of that. And it's like, why can't one of our biggest State Department yeah. Uh, ask should be look get them to ask us for this stuff right. right make it their idea make it their idea like we just want to help yeah we don't have to pilot these things we can train them to pilot it right because they don't want americans on the ground like I, and i got that um but you know a, a certain but i even i challenge that right i mean i understand amlo i, I get it right but yeah. i just think if you're the mexican people yeah, you're okay. I, I agree if with you that. Need some help to take out the cartels. Hundred percent. If, 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 if you if you like took a poll in Mexico City, yeah. and especially younger generation, I'm those like eighty. Yeah. So they come from a very different generation where they just have these. They have a lot more memory of American intervention. And whether some of that memory is valid and kind of yeah. made up narratives or not is, is is a different separate question. But they're but it's a huge chip on their shoulder. The younger generations really aren't like that. I mean, look, I grew up in Latin America. I have a pretty good idea of like how they feel about yeah. us, kind of American imperialism and all that. It's a popular slogan, but it's a popular slogan that only appeals to kind of a, a select few of the population. For the most part, you announce some big mili co, you know, cooperative military operation. Most Mexicans are going to be like, that seems like a good idea. So, so our guys aren't dying like because they have close air support now. Oh, that seems like a good idea. That's, that's I think that you're right. That's the reaction most people would have. So I think, you know, steps incremental steps um you've just got to you've got to take that first step and, and it takes negotiations it takes a lot of work with the mexican government yeah and a lot of that is sometimes behind the scenes um 
I hope it's a courier. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a feeling it's not. Yeah. It, it, it is in some places, yeah. right? Um, it's a different conversation, but uh, we're out of time, I think. Okay. I got to go, but uh, yeah. Chad, thanks for, Thank thanks for being on again, and it's always great to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for being our, our, first, our first guest for the task force. It's a perfect one. Thank you. Yeah.